Welcome to the Core Concepts Lectures. My name is James Renford Powell and this is a show where we have guests come and talk to us about their particular religion or their spiritual discipline and um, what they believe, why they believe it, and what they're doing about it. And in this instance we have as our guest Edward Ordman. And Edward is, um, is of Jewish faith but he has been very active in interfaith activities and that's where we've met on several occasions. And so I want to welcome you to the uh, show and you go right ahead. We won't take up much more time on, on okay. that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks for inviting me to speak. Um, I, yeah, he invited me as a Jew and I said, well, I was willing to come and talk about that on condition that I could also talk about interfaith. I describe myself as a Jewish interfaith activist. Um, so what I want to do is talk about how I learned about Judaism, and then talk about the Jewish religion itself, and then turn to the issue of interfaith. My father's father, who died before I was born, was an Orthodox Jewish rabbi. My father rebelled into agnosticism in late adolescence when his younger sister died of scarlet fever. He couldn't understand how God would allow that. So I was raised with a lot of Jewish education from my father, but very little institutional connection, and with my parents being agnostics. Um, well, my father was a wonderful storyteller, and he thought hard about philosophy and religion. I went to undergraduate school at Kenyon College, which is a little Episcopal college in Ohio. Well, it wasn't a little, very little school then. Episcopal College in Ohio which had an attached Episcopal Divinity School. So I rapidly acquired as friends a lot of Divinity students and undergraduates who were thinking at least, at least thinking of studying for the Episcopal priesthood. They asked me, what did Jews think about this? What did Jews think about that? Well, I knew what my father thought, but I knew his beliefs were not likely to be normative. Well, I was an enthusiastic student. I went to the college library and started trying to look them up. When I started asking questions the college librarian couldn't answer, he sent me half mile or so north to the Divinity School Library. When I started asking questions the Divinity School Librarian couldn't answer, he sent me to the Reverend Richard Henshaw, who was an Episcopal priest who was professor of Old Testament in the Divinity School. And I wound up auditing his courses. So I learned a lot of classical Jewish answers to a lot of questions from an Episcopal priest and the Jewish commentaries he was showing his divinity students, which was a strange form of education. But lo and behold, those answers made, made sense to him. They made a lot of sense about how the world was organized, and how the universe was organized, and man's place in the universe. So I started to pray regularly, and I started to feel pretty close to God. And I emerged from college as a Jew with what my father considered rather old-fashioned beliefs. <laughs> um, and I learned how to discuss Jewish ideas using Christian terminology, and with at least some background in Christian, and even more specifically, Episcopal theology. So. I hope it's clear that I'm not a rabbi. My Jewish training is a little non, non unconventional, um, and somewhat, somewhat, somewhat of going, some of what I am going to say is probably not going to agree with the reference books or agree with the next Jew you meet on the street. Um, but I'll, I'm going to try to give you a pretty traditional view as best I can. Um, let me point out. The Jews have been around a thousand years long, at least a thousand years longer than the Christians. And the Jews have therefore had a thousand years longer than the Christians to grow sects and denominations. But except in a few places like New York and Jerusalem, there aren't enough Jews in one place to build as many different buildings as the Christians do. So we have to get, a, a, we have to get along with a lot more varieties of belief and practice in one building. Um, and that's even more true in Memphis, where the Jews are a quite small minority. You know, it's an unusually small minority here. And as the consequence of that is the Jews have tended to stick together here more. We've got fewer and larger synagogues than the same number of Jews might have in most cities. Um, 
Another aspect is that the Christians early on decided roughly the way you got to be a Christian was by believing the right things. And the Christians spent a lot of time figuring out exactly what you ought to believe. Jews never did that. You got to be a Jew mainly by having, by having Jewish parents in recent centuries, more often by having a Jewish mother. And um, unless you want to go out and become something else, you're born a Jew and you stay a Jew, unless you really decide you don't want to be. Like some places and times, even if you decide you don't want to be, you're stuck with it. Remember mm -hmm. Nazi Germany mm -hmm. or Soviet Russia. Um, well, that was on your identity papers and you were stuck with it. Um, so the Jews, the Jews have never worried that much about what other Jews believe. Um, they do worry more about what Jews do, how you live it. Um, okay, you don't, you don't, you don't need to stop being a Jew just, for instance, because you become an atheist. Um, hey, Eunice and I are acquainted with one atheist who decided he really wanted to become a Jew and converted and became a Jew, but stayed an atheist. Confused a few people. But <laughs> <laughs> was, he, he said that the Jews were a tribe that was acquainted with grief and trouble. Yeah. <clears throat> and therefore, uh, it spoke to him because he had uh, been abused as now, he, a... Uh, he, he grew up on the Sioux Reservation. His mother had been a prostitute, so he was a half-breed. Mm -hmm. He was very much maltreated on the Sioux Reservation got out, went out, left there, sort of looking for some other tribe to belong to. <laughs> he said, ah, oh, here's a tribe that understands suffering. Okay, so what do Jews typically believe? Or what are they supposed to believe insofar as there's any kind of li list? Well, okay, they believe in God. They believe in a God who created the universe. Um, I don't know any put Jew. A date on. They put a date on it, but I don't. I don't know of any Jew who <laughs> feels that that contradicts anything you learn in science. I mean, those are just. I can give you other explanations if you want, but those are just two different categories of conversation. Mm. Um, Jews do very much believe in science. Science is very useful. It's very important. But anyhow, sometime maybe thirty-five hundred years ago, a man named Abram and Abraham who was living in the Fertile Crescent, Crescent, had this revelation from God. God told him to leave his home and take this trek over to the hill country at the east end of the Mediterranean, and said that there his descendants would become a great nation. Of course, then they ran into a famine there, and his grandchildren went down into Egypt and um, stayed stayed in Egypt for something somewhere between 200 and 400 years, depending on how you calculate it, got made into slaves, which was our first experience as an oppressed minority, persecuted minority. And then Moses, a guy leader called Moses brought the tribe, who were by then called the Israelites, out of Egypt after, well, you know the story of the 10 plagues. God visited plagues upon the Egyptians to convince the Egyptian ruler to let them go. Um, that's very formative in Jewish history and Jewish experience and Jewish prayer and ritual. And the Bible says over and over, um, do not oppress the stranger. Remember that you were strangers in Egypt. Um, after escaping from Egypt, the Israelites went and formed a kingdom in the land promised to Abraham by God. That was the kingdom of David and Solomon. That area was later conquered by the Assyrians and the Babylonians, and the Israelites were expelled. Under Cyrus of Persia, after he conquered the Babylonians, the tribe was allowed to return to the area around Jerusalem. And by then, most of them were descendants of a man named Judah, one of Jacob's children. The majority were descendants of Judah. So they came to be called Jews for that reason. Um, the teachers and pro the Jewish teachers and prophets of this period asserted that this god, unlike all the other tribal gods of the period, was actually the god of the whole world, and that one day all the world would recognize him. Um, 
couple of generations after Alexander the Great, the Jews became independent again under a leader of Skulp, under some rather violent revolutionary guerrilla warriors called the Maccabees. Um, and they stayed independent in a kingdom that was actually larger and more successful than Solomon's kingdom until the Romans came in. And in about 70 AD, the Romans again expelled the Jews from the area around Jerusalem. In the course of this successive series of expulsions, the Jews got scattered all over the world. I think the first synagogues in China were built around 900 AD. Um, but the Jews always kept praying to be allowed to return to Jerusalem. Now, frankly, had I been writing the Old Testament, I wish I, I, I wish God would have said to Abraham, okay, in this land you'll become a great nation, and then you'll spread out to the whole word, world and spread the word. I think that would have saved us some modern political troubles. But of course, God didn't say that. And while the Jews were for a while, particularly in er, 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 early Roman times, fairly successful at proselytizing, um, we've mainly not been a proselytizing religion. Um, we are, in my view, as much as anything else, still a tribe. Um, the God we relate to has, in fact, become recognized as God in a very large part of the world, but that's mainly due to the followers of a Jewish preacher of about 2,000 years ago called Jesus, and another guy about 600 years after that who was very impressed by the Jews and the Christians and tried to distill that doctrine down, and that, that of course was Mohammed. Um, I don't agree with all the things that the followers of those two preachers have said or done, but I sometimes feel like a parent of two extremely successful, if rather rebellious, children. Um, they carried the word to the world much more widely than the Jews did. And they carried the most essential parts of the message pretty well. Um, you know, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Um, and I have to say that the principles that uh, Renford has talked about are part of, you know, have, they, shall we say, at least considerable overlap with that complex of ideas. Um, I sometimes tease my Christian friends with this question. Um, hey, good Jews know that good Christians and good Muslims go to heaven. And good Muslims know that good Jews and good Christians go to heaven. Where did Christianity get off the track on that one? <laughs> That's a fun one to discuss if we get, when we get to questions, if you like. Um, okay. Our tribe, the Jewish tribe, does have some strange customs that many Jews have preserved. Um, you know, odd dietary laws. Now, other tribes have odd dietary practices too. It's just that, you know, if you live around your own home, you hardly notice them very much. I mean, the French eat a lot of frogs' legs and a lot of snails, and I don't notice them in Kroger's very much. <laughs> um, so if Americans want to eat ham and religious Jews don't, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's any terribly big deal myself. Um, some Jews want to argue that those rules that might have reasons, and we might even understand them. Some, either currently or someday, you know, maybe old people, maybe people in ancient world didn't understand trichinosis very well, and the leaders couldn't figure out any way to get, to tell them that you really have to cook that pork and ham well, well enough done. They certainly didn't have a thermometer they could jab to see what the temperature in the middle was. So maybe that's where, you know, as an anthropologist, if I were speaking as an anthropologist, I guess that's where the rule came from. Um, but, but there are probably other rules there, and we talk sometimes about the people believe, you know, where do they come from? Um, I point out that um, religious Jews and religious Muslims have known for as many centuries as we have records that if the cow is too sick to walk, you can't eat it. 
Food and Drug Administration only noticed that, was it three or four years ago during the mad cow problem? They passed that rule. Um, or maybe those rules were just to keep us separate from other people. Because if you don't eat dinner with members of the other tribes, your kids may be more likely to marry inside your own tribe. Um, but the, the normative view in traditional Judaism is, hey, God dictated those rules to Moses. We don't know why God did it. We don't have to know. All we know is he gave us those rules where his people will follow them. Um, very traditional Jews, the, Christian, the, the Jews who Christians might call the fundamentalists if they were Christians, um, believe that God dictated the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, to Moses at Mount Sinai. Um, they also think he explained a lot of other stuff to Moses on the side, and that God passed those things on to Joshua, who passed them on to the, the ju judges, who passed them on, and eventually they came down to the rabbis by word of mouth, and those eventually got written down. But you can argue an awful, the Jews can argue interminably over what those words mean or how accurately the later stuff was passed down. And those differences make up all the many different varieties of Orthodox Judaism. Or you can try to adjust those rules to the needs of the modern world. And how you make those adjustments make up the various branches of conservative Judaism, Reform Judaism, Reconstructionist Judaism, Humanistic Humanism. If I spent a little time with the reference books, I could probably list a dozen others. Um, according to the Jewish prophets, God also spoke to other peoples in other ways. So there's no need for those other people to become Jewish in order to be good people, or to get into heaven, if you happen to believe in heaven. Um, Jews don't think anyone was perfect. Even the characters in the Bible, a lot of them are very perfect. That's one of the things I liked about the Old Testament. I figured there was some hope for me if, I, <laughs> if they could be great prophets and make mistakes, why well, then I could too. Yeah, all, all, all of them. But in, in the New Testament, everybody has their halos firmly affixed. Yeah. <laughs> so, so everybody has room to improve. And on the other hand, everybody has the ability to share with God the task of what the Jews call tikkun olam, repairing the world. The world is a pretty broken place. Um, we need to work to fix it. Um, we don't think of existence as a burden that you have to escape from, like some kinds of Hinduism or Buddhism. And we certainly have plenty of Jewish stories about heaven or what things will be like after the Messiah comes. but. None of those stories are normative. You won't be hard put to find two Jews who agree on those stories. Um, they're just, you know, they're, they're, they're the folk tales, the tales you tell children, but they aren't articles of belief. Um, well, I know that every tradition I've ever heard of, Hinduism and all the rest, believe in life after death in form, some form or other. And yet, I don't see that there's any evidence that there is life after death. So I tend to think that when you die, that's it. In case we didn't introduce her at the beginning, this is my wife Eunice, by the way. Um, okay. The Torah and later commentaries contain a great many rules. The early commentators listed them and found 613 rules many of which are now obsolete. I mean, the rules about the procedures to follow for animal sacrifices in the temple, since the Romans destroyed the temple in the year 70, are thoroughly obsolete. Um, the first rule in the Bible, by the way, is the one given to Adam and Eve. Go forth and multiply. You didn't have any problem with that. No, <laughs> no. Uh, but traditional Jews are not supposed to be celibate. Yeah. You know, we've never had celibate priests or celib celibate leaders, and I think probably well, traditionally a lot of synagogues yeah. didn't want a rabbi who wasn't married. That kind of makes you wonder about Jesus when they called him rabbi, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, he was a religious man. He really ought to have been married yeah. and had kids, and we're a little puzzled by that. But he was itinerant, and that doesn't work too well in marriage. Yeah, yeah. No, that would no. The leave your leave your family and follow me of Jesus is something that bewilders the Jews. Um, 
Oh, there are plenty of rules on which different types of Jews, Jews differ. I mean, even within the Orthodox Jew, very Orthodox Jews, you'll get differences on fine point of the dietary rules. Um, hey, does the prohibition on building a fire on the Sabbath prohibit you from driving a car? Does it prohibit you from using a microphone to give the sermon? Boy, really get going here. Um, no Jew feels that non-Jews would benefit from following those technical rules. Those are, those are particular to the tribe. We do feel the rest of the world ought to care about the welfare of their neighbors and follow the inju important injunctions, you know, of feed the hungry, cure the sick, care for the widow and orphan. Um, how about the state of Israel? How can I avoid talking about the state of Israel? Um, can't do it. You know, there's been a lot of discrimination and persecution of the Jews over many centuries. Sometimes it's been worse in Christian countries, sometimes it's been worse in Muslim countries. Although I must admit official Muslim doctrine has been, on the whole, been much more consistent about and much more permissive about allowing the practice of Judaism. Christian doctrine has been very iffy about it at yeah. times. Whereas Muslim doctrine has always said, yeah, that's okay. That doesn't mean they've always followed that doctrine. It's always been there. Um, many Christians don't know that at the time of the expulsion of the Jews from Christian Spain in 1492, the Spanish Inquisition, the Sultan of Ottoman Turkey said, oh, goody, come here. You're welcome here. Come be Jews here. We like Jews. Um, I actually had a student at the university who grew up in a Jewish village in Turkey and grew up speaking a dialect of 15th century Spanish that that community had brought with it when they moved there from Spain. Um, anyhow, in many of the times when there have been persecutions, the Jews have dreamed of establishing a Jewish state in the ancestral home. At the end of the Second World War, European politics suddenly took a turn that made that possible. I think the Jews were probably as shocked as anybody else by that. But um, and, and it worked out in some odd ways. Um, most of the ancient Jewish state, the kingdom of David and Solomon, that's up in the hills. What's now the West, that's what's the occupied West Bank now, is where the old Jewish kingdom was. The populated parts of modern Israel are down in the coastal plain in the area that in the time of the Bible was occupied by the Philistines. It's a... Um, and, um, but that fact has led to some of the most difficult of the modern problems, the, um, the West Bank settlements, where you get fanatic Jews who say, no, I know there was a town there in, on that hill in biblical times. We got this important Bible story from there. I'm going to go build a town on that hill. Unfortunately, it's in the occupied West Bank. Um, from my own point of view, I very much want there to be a safe and peaceful and prosperous country for the Jews somewhere, a place where the Jews know where they can go, know that they can go when they're unwelcome or feel unsafe in some other country. Um, at the time of the fall of the Soviet Union, you may remember, about a million Jews moved from the Soviet Union to Israel, and Israel somehow managed to absorb them. Well, quite a number of them came on to the United States. Some of them came yeah, to the they, United States, they, but it was small compared to what wound up in Israel. Yeah, a lot of them went to Israel to get out of the Soviet Union and then... Then tried to go somewhere else. The United yeah. States. Yes, that's certainly true. Um, so, in my lifetime, that part of the Middle East has seemed to be the place where it might be possible to have a safe place, safe place for the Jews. And for the Jews, the historical connections make that area around Jerusalem awfully attractive. That's the place where the international Jewish community is certainly willing to support Jews who are trying to establish a Jewish state who are having trouble. You know, the rest of the world's Jews never got terribly enthusiastic about supporting a Jewish state in Berobajan or wherever the Early Soviets said, well, you can have one here if you want it. Of course, you understand, I'm older than he is. And uh, I remember that time, and I felt 
that the Jews ought to go someplace where they needed people, such as Australia or Alaska. They really needed people there. And if they went someplace where they needed people, they would be welcomed in quite a different way than going to Palestine, where there were people who lived there for 2,000 years in the absence of Jews who'd been elsewhere. And then they all of a sudden come saying, this is my home. Oh, well, oh. <laughs> there were always a few Jews there. But yeah, you're right. When the European Jews came in and tried to set up a European state and a European social system, this was probably about as much a shock of a shock to the Jews living there as it was to the Muslims and Christians living there. Anyhow. And they're a different category, aren't they? There's a, there's a different yeah, name oh yeah, for them. Yeah, the Sephardim. Yeah. Yeah, you're talking about or the Mizrahi or something. Mm -hmm. called. Um, anyhow, I, I don't see any way there can be a safe and peaceful and prosperous state for the Jews there unless there is also a safe and peaceful and prosperous state for the Palestinians there. And unfortunately, I don't think either U.S. policy or Israeli policy are working in that direction. I think there were a lot of elements in the United States who were absolutely thrilled at that shoot 'em up we had last week because it gave us a chance to try out our anti-missile missiles in combat situations. And lo and behold, one of them worked. Hallelujah, shoot off the guns. Can we try it again next month after we've made improvement? <laughs> no, it's a dreadful situation. Well, that, that uh, cast lead thing that they had, here you have the Palestinians all cooped up in the Gaza Strip. And then you start bo dropping bombs on them, some of which had phosphorus in, which they got from us. Yeah. And uh, phosphorus burns on contact. But look uh, at all the level. And wait a minute. Uh, the, the point of the matter is, it's like going into a prison with a machine gun and starting to shoot through all the bars at the prisoners. That's not anything but, but any look at all the lovely, religion should do. But look at all the lovely ammunition that got used. They got to put on extra shifts in some of the ammunition factories in Kansas City. Ooh. Okay, enough of that. What does one, you, you said, what does one do if one has this, with these beliefs or this religion? So what do Jews do? Well, if you're a synagogue goer, the main service is Friday evening at most Reformed temples, Saturday morning at most Orthodox and Conservative synagogues. They read a lot of scripture, put a lot of emphasis on those first five books. They talk about those and a lot of other traditional stories and writings and what those mean for life today. But an awful lot of Jews never go to synagogue. The general sense is that the way to be a good Jew, who's a good Jew? Someone who's engaged in trying to repair this rather broken world we live in through charity, through participation in charitable groups, working for the rights of minorities, working for peace, things like that. Um, there are a lot of places other than Israel where the Jews feel threatened. I'm going to give you two uh, examples that will seem strange from the American point of view, but they're big in the Jewish press right now. Um, there are efforts in some European countries to outlaw circumcision on the grounds that this is the parents making a child decision for the child that the child can make when the parent the child is old enough. Of course, what they're, I think the main impetus for this in European countries at the moment is probably to make life difficult for the Muslims who also believe in circumcision. But it probably stems in some places also from an anti-Jewish impulse. Um, in both some Europe- A Europe lot of Christians get their kids of course. circumcised too. Yeah. Not for religious reasons, but just for pure conduct. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, there is some evidence that it reduces transmission of AIDS, but I don't, know. I don't know whether that's convincing. The Jews say, well, God gave us that rule. We don't have to understand it. We just got to do it. Um, both Jews and Muslims believe that an animal that you're going to kill to eat must be conscious when you kill it. And there are periodic efforts in European countries and in some states to make that illegal. 
This is a place where the anti-Semites and the anti-Jewish people and the anti-Muslim people can line up with the animal rights people and say, oh, that's cruelty to animals. Um, but in the halal, halal of the Islamic it's strikingly uh, similar. They are very similar. It's yeah. strikingly similar. And um, again, our, the position of Jews and Muslims who want to justify it on any grounds other than, well, God said so, is, hey, wait a minute. You're supposed to have an inspector around there to prevent cruelty to animals. And if the animal is conscious and it's being maltreated, it's going to complain. And the other comment is, it's an awful lot easier to tell if the animal's healthy if it's conscious. Um, the main country that has always banned kosher slaughter in the last century or so is uh, amusingly enough in Switzerland. Because when Switzerland enacted its, but with Switzerland, remember, was the earliest country to really try to be tolerant of religion. They had Jewish cantons and Protestant cantons. And back as far as the 1860s, they realized, wait a minute, if we have too much religion freedom here, we're going to get all the Jews from the rest of Europe moving in. OK, we'll ban kosher slaughter. The Jews will have to import their meat from France. That way, we won't get outnumbered by the Jews. <laughs> Um, OK, a lot of Jewish communal work has nothing to do with Jews per se. Um, Eunice and I have, tra have traveled to Southeast Asia with a delegation from American Jewish World Service, um, which is an organization that specifically tries to assist local charities in their startup phases. Obviously, the local charities that we were working with in places like Cambodia and Thailand and, and you know, were, were obviously not Jewish people. You know, they were just local charities. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with an educational project called Facing History and Ourselves. If you haven't had a speaker from them, you need to get one. Um, that's a group that started, was started by Jewish activists and a lot of Jewish support. But what it does is mainly programs for school pupils about the necessity of moral choices with a major emphasis on civil rights issues. OK, enough about Judaism. You can come back to that in question period any time you want. But um, let me turn briefly to interfaith. Um, after my experience in college, I was always at home in my local church as well as my synagogue. Sort of always kept up both connections and kept talking to both groups. My first marriage was to an Orthodox Jewish woman. We followed the dietary rules. Um, that marriage eventually ended in divorce. Later in life, I met Eunice and fell very much in love with her. You can see how much in love we are. <laughs> we're, we're, she's a Christian and was very active in her church. Well, our kids had their religion set by former marriages. We weren't planning to have more children. So we decided, in this case, intermarriage would work. We just agreed that we'd both be active in both the synagogue and the church. As a Sunday school teacher, before I met Chet, I used to tell my Sunday school class that Jesus was a Jew all his life, that he never became a Christian. And they looked at me in shock, horror. Jesus was a Jew all his life. A short way. Yeah. yeah. So, in it any. It was an influential life, nonetheless. Nonetheless, <laughs> that it was. Um, so, so, we eventually both joined Temple Israel, which is a reformed Jewish synagogue. You know, that's because Eunice wasn't happy with the amount of Hebrew they had in the services in Beth Shalom, which is where I belonged previously. Well, they used to try and say the Hebrew just as fast as they could, so you couldn't possibly think of what does this mean. <laughs> that, was, that was a little weekday service that I went once just to show her what it was like. And taking yeah. her to show her, that was a mistake, I think. <laughs> the conservative, anyhow. We, I we, think we're happier in the reform. We're both active in Balmoral Presbyterian Church. We're both active enough in both that 
Eunice is agitated that the rabbis say, you need to change the emphasis in her Sunday school at Temple Israel. She's made some progress in that regard. And I've spoken up at Balmoral and said, you really ought to change the way you do your Sunday morning service this way. And, you know, they did it. Amazing. Is there um, any interfaith uh, group that you work with other than the one that we've met at? The, the, is there any kind well, of organization? Well, interfaith there. is us. Mm -hmm. That is to say, we started it. We started um, one. We, we, went, we were asked to go down to the Civil Rights Museum where everybody was representing some organization except us. They wanted uh, advice on how to popularize the Gandhi King Conference, which mm -hmm. obviously is trying to build peace. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we went home and we decided, well, gee, if everybody else is an organization, maybe we should be an organization too. <laughs> uh, and uh, so we decided that we would be an interfaith organization. Mm -hmm. And he's done most all the work. <laughs> With your ideas. Anyhow. <laughs> A few, anyhow, a couple of years after the tragedy of September 11, 2001, a sister-in-law, very a sister-in-law of Eunice, a very wonderful person, said she thought all Muslims were potential terrorists. Eunice said, "We need to do something about that." Well, I said, I, if an understanding, empathetic person like my sister-in-law could say that, it must be a fairly common thought, and, I and therefore. We ought to do something about it. And I heard it around, but Eunice was the one who said, okay, what are we going to do? And I said, well, the best way to establish relations is to go talk to the other guy. But I'm not sure a Muslim would feel safe or welcome right now in many places. I think a Muslim trying to walk into a synagogue or church might now right, be afraid to call the police and, or shoot first and think afterwards. Um, we better go to them. So we started attending Majid al-Salam, our neighborhood mosque, at the foot of Covington Pike. Um, I find it enlightening, incidentally, that Majid al-Salam and Beth Shalom both mean the same thing, house of peace. Um, it's amazing how often I hear essentially the same sermons and essentially the same Sunday school lessons in the mosque, the synagogue, the church. I think few people realize how very similar they are. This week, the first Sunday in December this year, it's the start is for Christians. Today is the start of Advent. It's the run up to Christmas. I've heard a lot of Advent sermons in churches in the last 50 years, but the best single Advent ever sermon I ever heard was in Majid al Salam on Stratford Road. Wonderful Advent sermon. Um, let me finish my little bit of script and then we can come back to that and other things. Um, the Eunice started making friends among the Muslims, and then she said, we got to get these people talking with each other. So she started throwing parties in our home where we tried to invite relatively equal numbers of Muslims, Jews, and Christians, and a few stray friends from the university thrown in, and just to get to know one another. And we started urging people to go to each other's houses of worship. That last idea was less successful than we liked. Many Christians are uncomfortable sitting or kneeling on the floor in the mosque. Although I must say the mosque will bring you a folding chair if you ask for one. And, uh, or even a regular chair. And traditional Muslims, the, the more fundamental Muslims, believe very much in Jesus as a great prophet. And the one who is going to return at the last judgment to judge people. But they are offended at the idea that he's God. That seems to violate monotheism to them and they don't want to get involved in what might look like the worship of a human being. So I started preparing lists of activities other than worship services in other houses of prayer, the potluck suppers, the concerts, the lectures, that kind of stuff. I publish those in a weekly email and a newsletter, and we have a website. And as Eunice said, eventually it was obvious that that needed to be described as something other than a sort of interfaith committee between Temple Israel Balmoral Presbyterian Church and Majid al Salam. So that's when we dubbed it the Memphis Interreligious Group. Our website is memphisirg.org. Um, we've been able to cooperate in a number of interfaith events and we've been available as a contact point. 
we get called with some frequency. Hey, we need a Muslim to come or a Hindu to come visit our Sunday school class. Can you find one for us? Um, who should we have as a Muslim speaker? Boy, was I complimented when I got a call and they said, who should we have as a Muslim speaker in the Calvary lecture series downtown? Wow. Um, and as it happened, wasn't it nice? Yasser um, Qadi had recently come to town and I introduced him to the Episcopal Bishop just a couple weeks before that question came in. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a street corner fight between Jews and Muslims. And somebody got hold of us, and we were the ones who called around and, you know, got, well, Eunice, Eunice had the contact, basically, that caused the district attorney's pastor, assist, assistant pastor at the district attorney's church to tap him on the shoulder after church Sunday and say, we better talk about this before the police reports at your desk tomorrow morning. The Memphis Jewish Federation posted a very nice message sympathetic to the Muslim issue issue in this case. And well, the Muslim actually, sent them a nice thank you note. Actually, it <coughs> started with a letter from uh, the session of the Presbyterian Church, which you read to them, and they... Uh, which the Jews then used as a model. Yeah, it was really a very interfaith solution to that problem. Um, and, and the whole thing ended up Peacefully, they uh, they had four different hearings, I think it was, for the four different people, and they dropped all charges from all four. And it and never hit the papers, and there was never a long, prolonged... Uh, we didn't want to drop... Muslims had a blog that was telling The Jews about, had a blog. Well, that means that IRG... Yeah, the, the Jews had a blog uh, that, that indicated how awful the Muslims were and how, and this was on the anniversary of the founding of Israel when Israel was, you know, being celebrated left, left right, and sideways. And, and uh, uh, you know, if the tragedy you're, for the Palestinians. If you're a Palestinian, for you, the founding of Israel was a disaster, the Nakba. And so they couldn't really that exactly and so they they had a few people peacefully walking around at the corner of Poplar and Highland with signs uh, which indicated uh, their feelings about this whole conflict. Pro Palestinian signs. Well yeah I mean it was a matter of the, the Palestinian side needed to have some exposure somewhere somehow. But that's where the problem began? A couple of Jews they showed up a, with a gun, a knife, had, and pepper spray. The, the Jews, had, <laughs> these rabid Jews, had planned this, according to their blog, well before the event. They had, the, you see, the, the Palestinians had asked for a permit. And so it was well known that they were going to be there on that day. And so the, the Jews uh, came there with 90 mile an hour pepper spray. Mm -hmm. and a knife and a gun. Now, uh, this is not a way to make peace. <laughs> no. uh, but it sounds like IRG was very effective. The police broke it up before, before the, that, after nothing but the pepper spray. But that that pepper was spray before IRG got going. Mm -hmm. One reason we got it going. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, they uh, sprayed pepper spray, 90 mile an hour, into the eyes of one of the sweetest, nicest, most cooperative, most peace-loving Muslims you ever saw. We had had him twice in classes at the University of Memphis that we were taking as students. And he was very, very cooperative. And he didn't even uh, hate the Jews for doing that. But it stung his eyes all the time. Are you teaching, what are you teaching at University of We Memphis? are retired and we go and audit courses. We audit, audit several courses a semester. When, when we were teaching semester, at usually. the university, he taught computer science all the way up to the PhD, never having taken a single course in it in his life. However, one, he's brilliant, and two, he had worked <laughs> with the uh, 
Bureau of Standards and knew a lot about the early days. I started in mathematics, she started in physics, we met in computer science. Mm. Oh my goodness. And, uh, I came along and, and uh, taught a course with Tannenbaum as a text called Co Computer Organization, which you can summarize as how does the computer know what you want to know, how does it find out for you, and how does it commu communicate its answer? Uh, how does it work, in other words? Yeah. <laughs> I got two other brief points I want to make. Um, I want to tell a story of a discussion we had when we got oh, Jews, well, Jews, Muslims, we had a few Christians there. But we got to discussing social services, and the issue came up of appropriate food for patients in hospitals. And the Muslims were excited to hear that the Jews seemed to have solved the problem of getting kosher food to patients in hospitals because they said, you know, we haven't figured out how to get halal food to patients in hospitals. Hey, wait a minute. Kosher food is automatically halal. The problem here is that Muslims wouldn't know to ask for kosher food. They'd ask for halal food. And when, uh, when, the, the, when the nurse gets asked for halal food, she wouldn't realize that kosher food is also halal. And um, of course, if it's a family from the Middle East with their kid at St. Jude Hospital and they bring them food labeled kosher, they're not even going to know that that's halal too unless we get a local imam in touch with them to explain that kosher food is also halal. Um, and you know, people from Muslim social services actually went out to the Jewish Community Center to talk to the people from Jewish social services to see what progress they could make on that. Um, Eunice and I are obviously not the only ones doing interfaith work in Memphis. There are quite a few others. We're probably not the most important in the great scheme of things. And in a country with a lot of tensions and polarities, Memphis is really a national leader in interfaith friendship and cooperation. There's been national publicity on the friendship between the Memphis Islamic Center and Hartsong Church, that neighboring Methodist church out on Houston Levy Road, um, because Hartsong invited the me me Muslims to use the Methodist building during Ramadan. And those two congregations hold joint Thanksgiving dinners and other events. They've, um, they've bought in common the land in between the two buildings to use as common facilities. Um, on, a no more, yeah, on a more trivial basis, you know, um, Anche Sfar, one of the, Bethlehem of Anche Sfar, it's a merged complicated name. But that Orthodox synagogue has an annual kosher barbecue contest, and the Muslim team has won prizes two years in a row now in it. <laughs> um, so there's a lot going on, and we're pretty proud of it. When, um, when we talk about in, in, the, in the, um, the Western world and, and in the um, Christian and, and uh, non-Jewish and so forth, we, you hear about the Kabbalah a lot, and, it, and it's pretty much embraced by all mystic, uh, mysticism. What's the, what's the uh, opinion or the thinking of the Jewish community about the Kabbalah? Or is it as varied as there are Jews? It's a, Almost as very sort of a small offshoot. Yeah, it, it's a it's a recognized form of Jewish mysticism. Reform pretty well ignores it. I think I think conservative Judaism doesn't pay much attention to mm -hmm. it. Um, of the Jewish groups in Memphis, the only one I would really expect to pay a whole lot of attention to it might be the Chabad, the um, Hasidic Jews. Mm -hmm. um, but nobody, it's a source perhaps of good stories. It might sometimes be cited as a source of moral lessons. Nobody really regards it as, very few Jews regard it as mainstream. So mostly it's embraced by non-Jews and not Jews themselves, right? I've certainly known Jews who were interested in it, mm. but I would say the, the percentage of Jews who are interested in it may be not, no greater than the percentage of the general population who are interested in um, medieval mysticism. Yeah. Now can I say something about what I believe? Absolutely. Um, 
Having majored in physics, I tend to think that science has a way of proving what they have to say. Uh, and uh, so I do not believe that Jesus rose from the dead bodily. Uh, if he did, it was a lot of effort to, for not much purpose because he didn't hang around afterwards. <laughs> so uh, I tend to think that there was a resurrection, but it was a resurrection of hope and dedication on the part of his uh, disciples and followers. There appears to have been a different kind of body anyway, one that could appear and disappear, one that could be felt. It was not a, not physical in the same sense of the word as we think of it. Um, well, you're saying maybe it was a vision. Well, it, maybe it was. I'm not saying it's either one. I'm just, I'm just saying that it was a. Uh, it, it, the, the biblical you, texts make it appear a very different type of body. The ways of looking at things varied a good deal. Uh, in the early days, look, Abraham and so forth, and even David, uh, they didn't know about modern science. And you can't expect God to talk modern science to people who don't know about it. But you can expect he will now. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, our Father who art in heaven, that doesn't say that Jesus was God, it says our, for everybody. Uh, but I, I heard that there were some men whose fathers were abusive and they didn't like that idea of God being a man. Uh, now the Christian scientists who have a lot of mistakes, but uh, they do talk about father, mother, God, and I think that's a good concept. Uh, you can find good concepts where you find them. You don't have to throw away a concept just because you found it here instead of there. Um, so, uh, so I tend to believe that the resurrection was not a bodily resurrection, but the resurrection of hope and dedication on the part of his followers, which would make a lot more sense especially since he didn't hang around after his supposed resurrection anyway. Uh, so uh, there's a book that we uh, ran across that uh, rather appealed to us. It was, the Holocaust is over, let's get on with it. Uh, because, Avram Berg, I think, who was a former speaker of the Israeli Knesset. Uh, the idea being that uh, Jews in Israel keep saying that they have to have a Jewish state in Israel because of the Holocaust during World War II. Now, yes, the Holocaust during World War II was horrible. It never should have happened. Uh, but you can't change history. All you can do is deal with it. And I think you have to deal with it more or less realistically. And since we now have modern science, we do not have to go by the unscientific things that they had in the old, old scriptures. Uh, but uh, uh, I think you have to say, well, I, I, at one time I asked myself, I said, can you prove that there's a God? No. Can you prove that there's not a God? No. Well, then what do you do? Well, I looked at mathematics and I said, uh, in order to prove any theorem, you have to have two assumptions. Uh, the regular geometry assumes that a straight line goes on forever and uh, uh, so on. Uh, but so I decided, well, since I've got a chance to make some assumptions here, what do I want to make? What do I think I'd be happier with? Well, I'd rather think I'd be happier if there were a God. Okay, so I'll believe in God. <laughs> and uh, what kind of, kind of God do I want to believe in? Well, it appears that God created the universe. Uh, 
So I can believe in a creator God. And so where does that evil come from? Well, uh, I think you have to say that God's left us with freedom. And that left us free to be good or bad. Other questions? Anybody have a question? For Eunice or for uh, Edward? Incidentally, you? about Christianity, I have some differences with it. <laughs> you may have noticed. <laughs> well, don't okay. feel bad because I have differences with all of them. Yeah. And, and I don't believe that any is absolutely necessary in the human process. I believe if one is able to identify and verify each of those 13 principles, one either knows there's a God or they doesn't. And I think once if you're able to identify and verify each of those principles from your own life experiences, it put, it, it's almost like a paradigm shift. It's like you're moving over and taking a look at yourself from the outside. And that you know whenever anyone else is talking about books or they're reading or you're reading a book or in a seminar, you know where they're coming from. If you've been able to identify and verify these for yourself, you know whether they're coming from academia, from doctrine and dogma, or just blowing smoke. And you'll never walk down the street wondering what hits you. You know what's going on because you understand the principles that are in play. So, I mean, I, I, I can agree with you to a great deal there. I want to uh, suggest that you ask, you didn't know where they got off track. And I think it was with Constantine in 325. You know, you were talking yes, about getting off track. That's, that's where they got off track because he wanted to create these absolutes and, and, and he wanted to unify his kingdom. And, and I think the spirit went out the window with well, Martin Luther. Well, until the, until. the Catholic Church is going to have to do something or they're going to fail mm -hmm. because uh, having a celibate uh, clergy and celibate nuns and so on and so forth. Uh, and he's the one, you're talking about celibacy, that's the one who took it to the West was Paul, the Apostle Paul. Yeah. And he's the one that, that, that promoted that uh, celibate yeah. concept. Yeah, he's the one that invented Christianity. That's right, in my view yeah. too. Right. <laughs> I, I want to thank all of you for being with us on the core concepts today. I want to thank Edward uh, uh, Ordman and Eunice. We put Eunice in the schedule with as the speaker. I failed to make that clear that she was would be uh, uh, talking as well. And I want to thank both of you for being with us. And I want to thank all of you for watching Core Concepts. These have been.